Bright Spaces is the digital leasing platform for commercial real estate. They are enhancing the showcasing, inventory and lead management, reporting and communication between landlords, brokers and tenants. Hello everyone, I am Bogdan from Bright Spaces and it is our great pleasure to support this episode. In the PropTech world, Anthony was and still remains one of the most relevant minds in the industry. Thank you, Smaranda and Vlad, for making this possible. And for the rest of you, enjoy the episode. On campus. Some time ago, the business community replaced long-term and short-term planning with its military equivalents, tactics and strategy. General Carl von Clausewitz describes the two as the following. Tactics are the movements we do in the presence of the enemy, while strategy is the sense of military movement outside the reach of the enemy's cannon. In our today's conversation about the world of work, we will wonder, is working from home a mere tactics to withstand the pandemic, or is it a big move we are making towards a more flexible work-life balance? How should the strategy for the workplace look like now and after the pandemic? Is the office a place or a context for productivity? We're so grateful to have Anthony Slumbers with us today to share his valuable perspectives. Anthony Slumbers is a globally recognized speaker, advisor and writer on PropTech and Space as a Service. A serial entrepreneur, he has founded and exited several PropTech software companies and now consults real estate boards on their transformation, technology and innovation strategies. He writes an influential blog at anthonyslumbers.com and is a prolific tweeter at Anthony Slumbers. In 2020, he co-founded the Real Innovation Academy, an online real estate training company. Anthony, thank you so much for headlining our podcast. It's a very great pleasure to be here. It's great to have you and we are honored to share a bit of uh, the wisdom that you are also sharing with your, uh, with your students. I will try and perform properly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, then I see Vlad was buzzing to ask you a few questions. So I don't know. Go ahead, Vlad. Is it that obvious? Yeah, a bit. I'm always so excited to learn more about space as a service from you. I've first heard the term from you. And could you please just uh, explain it a bit more for our audience today? I always say that space as a service actually has two meanings, and it's important It's important to understand that there's two meanings. The first meaning is the procurement of space as a service. So I, I need a meeting room for an hour, a day, a month. Um, so any sort of short-time procurement, that's one meaning of spa- space as a service. But the, actually the more important meaning of space as a service is spaces that provide users, customers, with the services they require as and when they need them. So the the point is about about space that is aligned with the jobs to be done of of the individual. What is it that an individual is trying to do and how well does this space provide them with the service they need to do it? And that's a really important difference because this is, space as a service is not just about short, short term space. You, you could have a 25-year lease and still run your office on a space-as-a-service basis. So it, it, it's both. That is a big move from the traditional perspective of real estate. It's a, it's a very big move. It's, a, it's a, fundamental, a fundamental repurposing of what real estate is all, all about. It, it's actually, it's actually re, re-centering real estate around around humans it's putting humans at the center of the value proposition so the the job of someone in real estate is of course it is to still build and manage real estate but but the real job is providing their 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 customers with what it is that enables them to be in an office context as productive as possible in a retail context as happy as possible in a in a residential uh, context as comfortable as as possible so it's it is a, it really is an absolutely fundamental th- uh, change in attitude from the bricks and mortar being the important point 
to actually the end user being the, the important point. So yes, it's it's fundamentally changing the in industry from one that's that's um, that's designed to sell a product to an industry that's there to deliver a service. So it's changing the industry from a product industry to a service industry. And that's where the biggest opportunities I, I think lie and the biggest challenges because a company that is designed as a service company is very different to a company that's designed as a product company. And this is the teething problems that I think real estate is going through that traditionally, certainly in the office market, the customer for an office has not been the end user at all. It's actually been the, the investor. It's been the whoever's financing it. And really, whoever's in the in the office doesn't doesn't almost almost doesn't matter. You don't have to pay any attention to the to the customer, especially in the historic world of where a customer will sell, sign a long lease. I was listening to something yesterday, and someone was saying the for uh, for an occupier for a company taking a lease, their maximum moment of leverage is in the five minutes before they sign that lease. <laughs> because as soon as they sign that lease, they it's over. They have no leverage. And that's not going to happen anymore. And that's what makes real estate so, I think, so fantastically interesting at the moment, that because of this change to being a service-led industry, it's raising the bar in terms of the quality of product and the quality of of service and operation and that, and how we manage manage our spaces because we're going to have to be much much better and who whoever can create and curate the best user experience is going to be the winner it's not necessarily going to be about the best real estate as such it's going to be who can create and curate a user experience that the customer is prepared to pay more for than they ever have done before I, I always use the, the the analogy of the um, of the iPhone. The iPhone is a, is extraordinary in this. That this is this is a statistic from a few years ago now. But it used to be the case that the iPhone um, had eighteen percent, one eight percent of the global market for smartphones. But it actually made, but Apple actually made eighty two percent of the profits. So a small market share, but they made almost all the profits. Why did they do that? because Apple control the hardware, the software, and the services, and they create a user experience that tens of millions of people will say, that's so expensive, oh, it's a ridiculous price. Oh yeah, okay, I've got to buy it. <laughs> and that's the difference, because the user experience is so good that they can charge a big premium for it. And so in real estate, the key to real estate going forward at the operational level is going to be Whoever can create the best user experience will be able to generate, will be able to generate the most revenue. Everyone's talking now about the future of work, and you just told us how um, the world of work is changing. But is this what you refer to in your latest article when you say this is now acceleration, it's a revolution? Yes, I, I think people are making an, a mistake in thinking that what has been going on is just an acceleration of what was happening and happening anyway. A lot of people are saying, well, people used to work some of the time from home anyway. This is just doing a bit more, more about it. And I think, no, that that's that's wrong because the 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 point is the different the difference potentially going forward is that yes, we had people um work, working away from the office a certain a certain amount of time. But essentially, the companies were office-centric companies. That was the base. The business was, was based inside that office. What is happening and what has happened the last year is clearly not only have the people left the building, the company has left the building. And it's all migrated to the crowd. And so whoever, whoever wants whatever in, information can get it where, wherever they want. And... I think it's a revolution because the the types of companies that are really going to make the most of this are ones that are going to be deeply digital. 
So their 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 business is going to be based in the in the cloud, all access to to knowledge and the um, different stakeholders will be di digitally enabled, and they will operate in in a in a different way, and that's. That I think is going to give certain companies, companies that embrace distributed working are going to potentially have a, a big advantage because they're going, to, they're going to be more efficient and effective because they have to be. There's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of making life easy if you're all sitting around the same table because I can just say it, say it to you. But that's all very well until you go and someone else goes, and then I have to tell this new person everything, and we ha we don't have it written down. We have to start again in a fully digital company. Essentially, the knowledge is in the system, and people can people put everything into the system. So whatever you need is is available available immediately, and whoever you want to hire is is available to you because there's this thing about if you have an office in one location, your potential talent base is however many people are within, say, an hour of that building. If you change to a fully distributed, your your talent pool is the whole is where world. is wherever it's it's much much bigger. So it's potentially it's potentially a really revolutionary change for the companies that are, that adopt it. For a lot of companies. I don't. I think. I think a lot of companies are going to make a mess of it, and are going to go back to the office. Some people in, some people out, but they won't have fully digitized their businesses, and they they find it doesn't work. And a lot of companies will be fully back in the office, inefficiently working, um, trying different things. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I am so glad you drove the point home, so to speak, with technology because. We uh, met you through PropTech, and I was curious how and where does technology fit into this new real estate and office paradigm? Well, what, what has happened the last year has clearly been a really bad thing. It has not been good for anybody. But if from the point of view of PropTech, it's actually been the best thing the best thing that ever has ever happened to proptech because proptech adoption is going to be utterly transformed over the next the next few years for for two for two particular reasons first off there's the whole side around um health and health and well-being and simply being safe because with the with the with the virus we know that being indoors in a confined space with poor ventilation can kill you. It really can kill you. A building can do a lot of damage now. So buildings are going to have to show the people in them that they are safe places to be. Now, to make a building safe, you 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 primarily have, have to look after the environmental conditions. So you have to look after the air, the air quality and, and uh, all those sorts of things. And you probably have to do quite a lot to do with uh, touchless te technologies and, make, and making things seamless. So there's a huge amount of investment is going to have to go into buildings just to make them safe because you cannot expect everyone to come back to your building if you can't prove to them it's safe. And what we do know is that there's an awful lot of buildings with really bad ventilation really bad ventilation yeah we can we can smell them that bad <laughs> very poor systems and we've known this for a long time this is not this is not new and we've known known it for a long time but now you're going to have to do something about it and who and again one of the, one of the competitive advantages for someone in real estate is how healthy are their buildings people will want to go to buildings that that are healthy. So there's a whole range of prop tech solutions that are going to be required to enable buildings to be safer. But also, when you're making them safer, we've at the same time, what has happened the last year has almost been like an early warning 
of what might happen with climate change. <laughs> you know, if we, if we don't sort out climate change and the and carbon, we last year might look like a picnic. So we all know there's a great deal of work that needs to be done towards sustainability. Now, sustainability and health have an overlap is probably a very strong correlation between a safe building and a sustainable building because it's part of the ethos of how you develop. As someone who's interested in making a building really safe is probably interested in making it sustainable. And a lot of sustainable materials are also needed in, in making things safe. So there's that whole side of um, technologies required around sustainability and, and health and then, but the flip side of this, where I think it's really interesting is because we have to spend money to solve these health problems and environmental condition problems, we are actually going a long way to creating more productive office spaces. Because people talk about, you can't measure the productivity of an office. You can't do this, you can't do that. And I always say, no, you, you're completely wrong here because what we do know is that bad environmental conditions impact on the cognitive function of someone. So if I put you if I put you two in the room you're in now and turn the temperature up 20 degrees, you're not gonna think as clearly. If For I made, sure. turned it down 20 degrees, you wouldn't think as clearly. If I made it too, too light or too noisy, you wouldn't think so. We know this. There's lots and lots of peer reviewed research linking environmental conditions to productivity. So. We are having to solve, we are having to create better environmental conditions in our buildings because of health reasons. But by doing so, we are actually creating better, better real estate, better space for people. Because the key to so much productivity is putting people in an environment that enables them to perform as well as they're capable of performing. So I can't. As, as as real estate people, we can't make a bad company good. You can't do that, but you can make a bad company better. And you can't you can't make you can't make an average person a genius, but you can make an average person perform as well as they are capable of doing. So it's this combination of environmental conditions and space space as a service that's appropriate for what they have to do. So the more as real estate people, we can help customers understand what it is they're trying to do, put them in the right environment, the right physical environment for that, and put them in the right environmental conditions. So you think of someone, someone trying to do uh, focused individual work. So maybe, maybe they're trying to um, create a, present, a presentation. If you put them in, if you put them in the middle of an open plan office, which is really noisy, that's a terrible. You, you reduce their productivity enormously. If you put them in a nice quiet room with the right lighting and the right noise and the right environmental conditions, you make them as as good as they they can be. So every single step of making um, real estate better better and to do what we need to do. It, is involving technology. And then on top of that, you have this fundamental point that apart from really starting to understand that buildings can, can harm us if the conditions are right, we now know that work actually doesn't have to be done in an office because we've done it for a year. It doesn't have to be done in the office. My point is always that you, you, you're moving from your customer having to buy your product to a situation where you have to make them want to buy your product. So the real estate industry has got to has got to create products and services that mean it is better for me to come to the office than stay stay at home. And you're just going to have to try an awful lot harder and all of that is going to is going to involve involve te technology. So throughout throughout the whole real estate stack all of this technology that is much of it has been around for quite a long time and people have not had to use it now they suddenly do have to use it because if if we can, if 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 manhattan or this or london cannot get pe office workers 
back into Manhattan or the centre of London, it's got a problem. It's got a big problem. So technology is, is core, absolutely core, to solving what could be... I, I think of it almost like an existential opportunity and existential threat at the same time. Because I think what's going to happen within real estate is you're going to get a lot of a lot of losers, people who are not creating real estate that their customers want anymore, and their and their assets aren't going to go down ten percent. They're going to go down fifty percent, or they're not going to be usable at all. And then you're going to get the real estate people who really try and understand the wants, needs, and desires of their customer and provide space for them. And I think they are going to do better than ever and generate more money than ever. So instead of a market where everyone's a genius or an idiot at the same time, you know what the real estate cycle is like. At the top of the cycle, everyone looks like a genius. And at the bottom of the cycle, everyone looks like an idiot. The market is not going to go like that anymore. It's going to go, some are going to go up and some are going to go down. The, the stat, I always say to people, standing still is going to be almost impossible. Just, just doing the same as you did before and hoping things are okay is going to be really, really difficult. You are either going to be quite a big loser or quite a big winner. Just being okay is going to be very hard. It's going to be very hard. I need to ask here as a real estate person, because you touched on the way we need to create spaces that um, make people healthier and make people more productive. But where do we start, Anthony? Well, the the the, the health area is, is around environmental conditions. So you you put people in you put people in space where the environmental conditions are as good as they as they can possibly be. And we know how to we know how to do this. You, you need to take account of air quality, noise, temperature, lighting, and then other things. But air quality, noise, temperature, lighting, get those right, and you've gone a long way to make making people healthy. And then making people productive is partly a function of putting them in the right environmental conditions. But it's also going to be a great deal about, and as I say, understanding their, their wants and needs. And this, again, is where technology comes in. This is much more than just counting desks, counting is this desk occupied or not. Is, is this desk occupied and is it the right space for whatever it is that the occupier is trying to do? And as I say, you might have a desk with somebody there and it's occupied 100% of the time, but they're trying to write a, write a report, but the desk is in the middle of an open plan office where it's really noisy. So in, in one way, if you just look at desk occupancy, that would look good. That desk is occupied. But in qualitative terms, it's a really bad place to put to put someone. So we are going to have to understand the quantitative, so the, the factual workings of an office, the numbers, if you like, and the qualitative, how well does this, this space suit the job to be done of the person? We're going to need to understand those much better and then continually optimize optimize our, our space. So I, I, have a, I have a slide that I use a lot where it talks about in the, in the tech industry. So anyone who's worked in the tech industry knows that the first thing you're told in the tech industry is what you do is you build, measure, learn. So you build something, you get it in the hands of a customer, you measure how it works, and then you, and then you iterate on it. Build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. In real estate, we stop at build. So what so often happens in real estate is we build we build a building or we build a, a workplace and they and they're beautiful. On day one, they're perfect. As soon as you put people in there, they start to mess mess up all the perfection. And what we don't do is we often measure the success of a workplace as soon as it's in operation. And then we maybe we might come back in a year and see if it's still successful. Whereas really we need we need to be monitoring monitoring and optimizing space all all the t all the time, and that's going to take that's going to take lots lots of different technologies to to be able to do that. But the the 
the the point to remember here is that this is not just it's not just a tech on its own won't solve the problem in the same way as humans on their own won't solve the problem this has got to be a human what i call a human plus machine solution so you need you need to have the data to work with but then you as a human need to have the judgment and the critical thinking to understand what to do with that data so another problem in the real estate industry historically is we haven't collected much data and then when we have collected it we haven't really known why we've collected it we've just collected it because people have said you must collect more data and so they've been collecting data and no one does anything with it or they don't know why they're why they're collecting it but we need to we need to collect a lot more data but data with purpose why are we collecting this data because i need to understand what it is Vlad, that you are doing during the during the day and how satisfied you are with that because if i can change your environment or say look it'd be much better if you moved over here you would be much closer to the meeting room you always used you would be closer to the people you interacted with and the temperature in this part of the building is more suitable for you that things like that so it's it's it it's it's interesting how the real estate industry is becoming much more like the consumer goods um, industry. So if I'm selling a pair of sunglasses or I'm selling bananas or I'm selling clothes, I have to know, know an awful lot about my customer. And we've never really needed to know anything about our customer because, as I said, historically, the customer was the, in, was the investor. Now, of course, the investor is still, you still got to keep the investor happy. Obviously, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're suddenly in this fantasy land where, you know, the money doesn't matter. All of this is to make the money perform better. But to make the money perform better, we now have to understand the customer. We've never done that before. So there's so many, th there's so many technologies that are available for, to us to understand customers and behavior so so much better so, and um we're gonna start start doing doing that so real estate is going to up its game after this real, real estate is going to completely right. up its game That's but it's great. also it's but it's going to it's going to become a different industry it's going to become a better industry because it's going to become if you, if you think about a workplace i always think to create a really great workplace you need real estate skills. So you need to build physically a good building. Then you need to understand um, networks, Internet of Things networks. Where am I going to put my sensors? Then you need to understand data analytics. How am I going to analyze the data from my sensors? Then you're going to need to understand workplace design. Then you're going to need to understand HR, human relations, personnel. And then you're going to need to understand hospitality. All the six different industries involved with creating a really good experience. And at the moment, they don't really talk to each other. But I think in the future, the real estate company of the future will start to be a mix of all, of all six of those. So the, the type of people in real estate are going to become more diverse um, and more multi-skilled. Multi so we're going to need different 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 skills it's not dissimilar to to the hotel market the hospitality market so it, the the hospitality and office markets are starting to to really overlap and in hospitality you need a lot of different skills beyond real estate and real estate companies are going to be be like that I guess that's so good for me since I worked last six years in hospitality before doing real estate. So, <laughs> But you speak a lot about uh, innovation and real estate, which honestly, from my experience, I've never heard the terms together before, at least not in our industry in Romania. And um, we can see behind you that uh, Real Innovation Academy shows its name. So would you be kind to tell us more about that? Because I know you have some cool projects teaching people in real estate about this mix that's going to happen and where they can learn more. Yeah, well, 
the Real Innovation Academy is is something I set up with uh, my partner called uh, Draw, Draw Poleg, who lives in New York, who many of you might, many of your <laughs> listeners might also know. He wrote the most fantastic book called Rethinking Real Estate. Everyone should read Draw's book. It's 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 brilliant. Um, but we started thinking the end of 2019 that there's a need to within the industry teach real estate people about technology and technology people about real estate because they tend not to real estate people don't know anything about technology and technology even prop tech people don't know much about real estate so the start the starting point of the of the course was thinking well what do we need to tell what do we need to help real estate people understand about technology so that they can communicate with technology companies much better. They know the questions uh, to ask. And what can we teach technology people about real estate so they understand the, the industry much better? Because a lot of technology people criticize the industry and they say, oh, they're not very innovative and they never buy anything. And they're, they're all Luddites and they're all far behind. What they don't understand is that historically, that has, in business terms, that has been that has been the best thing for a real estate company to do. To, to not be, they haven't needed to be innovative. That, that, that's the, the, the point. It worked fine. Build a decent building, you could sell it. Build an office building, you could let it. Easy. We're now we're now in a so so these two have to um, uh, know more about each other. And then as we started developing the course, we realized that at the heart of both sides is, in, is innovation and how to, think of, how to think about innovation. So we started adding, adding in more on the course in terms of some of the, the, the best known frameworks for how to think about innovation, how to adopt a, in, innovation. So we've created this um, five-week five online course, which both of you are alumni of. <laughs> Um, everything is online apart from once a week. We have what were one and a half hour sessions. We now have two hour sessions because we can't we can't keep it to one and a half hours. Two try, every, once a week we all get we all get together, and we've been l- lucky enough to attract an incredibly diverse range of people from around the world in different areas of real estate. And it's become I I I now call it it's the uh, hashtag brain food for innovators. So it's it's somewhere to you'll learn, you'll learn more about real estate, you know more about technology, you'll learn more about innovation. But in a way, most importantly, you'll get an opportunity to 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 think and act and interact with people in your industry who you probably would not come across other otherwise. And so, overall, what we're trying to do at the academy is build a network of the most innovative people in real estate around, around around the world. So we're looking for people who want to do new things, want to build a better built environment, who 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 want to create new business models, who are thinking differently. Um, and if you go to real estate innovation, real realinnovationacademy.com, um, you'll see the office course there. And in three weeks' time, we're doing the same thing, but for housing. So exactly exactly the same theories, but with the the central asset class is going to be tailored towards housing. And as an alumni of your course, I must say that it was quite an experience and quite a ride. And I, I am really grateful for, as you said, uh, the hive, the connection we had with different people from technology and real estate mixing together. And that is uh, it's uh, the the biggest uh, value. Now, Vlad, you wanted to add something else before our funky question? Maybe just to say what you said again, that as also as an alumni, I encourage all our uh, fellow industry colleagues in Romania to join this course because it helped a lot. And since we are a newborn in the real estate industry compared to other industries um, in other countries, it's a huge opportunity for us to just uh, cut the corner and uh, start from where we should be and adopt these big changes that are coming our way. Or at least understand them better. And I, one more thing I, I want to add is that I'm taking with you the phrase 
make the money perform better because real estate <laughs> is is all about money and this technology and innovation is actually not against the old model but it's pushing the old model towards better performance even from the money that, perspective that is really really in, important it can sometimes seem when we're talking about all these things that we're for, forgetting that real estate is the biggest asset class in the world and it does involve an awful lot of money and money is important and it has to make a it has to make a profit and none of none of what we're talking about even all of my arguments about the office is not saying when i when when i when i produce an argument saying well people will need less office space it's not me saying the office market is a bad market to be in it's me saying the office market is actually still a really good market to be in but you need to do x y x y z and it's not a free ride you need to think think a bit harder but if you want to keep making that money work better you have to adapt adapt and adopt new new ways of thinking okay now funky question for towards the end of our discussion let's pretend the coronavirus uh, thing is over pandemic is under control and you are anthony slumbers a junior or mid senior developer at an it company and your company decided to adopt a flexible uh, work uh, model so you have the the freedom to choose where do you work from what would you choose fully remote fully in the headquarter a hybrid of the two what beach would you go to with your laptop to work from <laughs> and why it's the the there is no correct answer to to that question and there is no right answer to that question it absolutely depends on your company your employees the work that they do and their personal cir circumstances so for instance if if you're a comp if you're a company who mo whose employees most of the time are working with other employees most of what they're doing is collaborative work you are probably going to need to spend more time together than if you're a company that does a lot of individual focus work so maybe you're a company that's more on the basis of 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 create of creating reports and documentation and that sort of thing you don't need to be so so much so much together um what i think you have to do is you have to you have to you have to survey all your employees and you have to understand what did they do before the pandemic where did they work before the pandemic and how did that work for them how have they been during the pandemic and that is going to, that is going to vary so there'll be there'll be people like me who are lucky enough to have worked like this for a long time and i have a really nice office at the end of my garden <laughs> but there'll be other people to whom they're having to work in their bedroom and clearly there's a different there's a different requirement there but you also need to understand what it is what it is people need are it gets back to this what are their jobs to be done what do they do during the day and what inputs do they need so if the only input i need somebody needs is the internet i don't need to worry too much about putting them together with with everyone else but if the input someone needs is the rest of my team then the team need, needs to be able to get get together and then you also need to take into account well, where do people live now so obviously this varies ge geographically around, around the, the world so i live 30 50 kilometers south of the center of london but it takes me an hour and a half so 90 minutes to get from where i live to the center of london and then back so it's three hours a day so historically i've only done it once or once or twice a week but from my local station there are maybe 30,000 people who do it every day 
So that's three hours. That's 15 hours a week. Why? If if I am going when when I go up to up to London, it's to have meetings with people. So I never go to London to do work, as it were. It's always to 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 meet people. Per- perfect use of time. If I was going to London, and I used to do it in <laughs> earlier in my career, used to go to London to sit at a desk to sit at a typewriter at a computer all day. Well, that's, there's no point in, in doing that. So you really have to understand the circumstances of, of your employees. Where do they live at the moment? The longer people's commute, the less time they will want to spend in the office, clearly. But they might need to work somewhere near home. So maybe they haven't got a good space to work at home, but could we, could we find them a local space where they could work so they don't have to come, come in? Um, so you have to you have to break down your company to the jobs to be done of individuals. What are their what inputs do they need? What their personal circumstances are, and once you've done that, you can start then to design. Well, seventy percent of our people say actually they're more than happy and they're productive to work two days two days a week at, at home. In which case, they might as well do that. If they're productive doing that, why why not do that? But what is it on the three days that they really need? Well, the bit the bit they are missing from home is probably the collaborative thing and the team and the socializing and the mentoring and the training and everything. So let's pay much more attention to what it is that can be done in the office that is better than at home. And I think this is sort of the fundamental point is to say, what does someone need to do and what's the best place to do that? And there are many things where the best place to do that is in an office, but it's in an office designed for those particular types of things, in which case, bring them in to do that. Otherwise, let them work from home or let them work from from somewhere locally. So it's what, what you absolutely mustn't do is skip the stage of actually gathering all, all this data. Because if you just say, oh, well, we're going to let people work two days a week at home and let them choose, you'll have this ridiculous situation where you have some of the people in the office a lot, some of the people at home or somewhere else, and then you'll end up with two companies. You've, I'm sure you've all been in those meetings where there's six of you in a meeting and there's one person remote. They might as well be on planet Mars. You know, they just don't 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 get a look in. You either have to design the meeting where the meeting is inclusive deliberately, or you have to have, have, avoid that situation. But you also get the situation where I will come in on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but you are only in on Monday and Thursday, and you're my team. So I come into the office, and my team's not there. What's the point of that? <laughs> so the the the, dyna- the dynamics of who needs whom is really important. So if the three of us are working together, we need we need to work out what we need as what we need as a team. And that might be that we need to be in five days a week, or it might mean we need to be in five days five days a week whilst we're doing this particular project. But what um, I'd listen to. The uh, the COO of Salesforce on a on something the other day, and he said what they've done, which I think is makes a lot of sense, is they have asked every team to write what they call a team agreement. So the team has to say as a group, this is these are the members of the team. This is what we do. This is when we need to be in the office. Why we need to be in the office what type of space we need in the office. And this is when we need to be somewhere else. So the team has to agree amongst themselves. Okay, every Tuesday morning between nine o'clock and 12 o'clock, we're all going to be in the office. And we're all going to have a a communal meeting. Otherwise, we'll be somewhere else. So each team has to work out how do they work most, most effective effectively and actually i work i worked like this for years when i was doing my um company vicinity which was a joint venture i did with with british land 
um, which then was the biggest property company in the in the UK. And we were writing property management soft, software for all their office buildings. But we had people working all over the place. But on Wednesdays, everyone, the whole team got together on a, on a Wednesday. And we did, we did it for years. No one was allowed to have a meeting with anyone else on a Wednesday. You had to be there. And we would meet, spend a lot of time together, go through everything, and then we would go out in the evening. And then we'd go somewhere else for the rest of the week. So we, we, we did the bonding, we did the, the social, we did the, gave ourselves time to really dive into things. Um, so that, that's the, the key point. You have, to, you have to find out from everybody what their real needs are um, and what their circumstances are, and then work, work back from there. It's not going to be easy. A lot of companies are just going to say, oh, we'll come in um, two, uh, three days a week, and then you're going to have a company where – Monday and Friday, the office is going to be empty, and then people will be in in the middle of the, the week, and everyone will be in, so you use the same amount of space, but two, 40% of the time it's empty. There's going to be a lot of – it's not going to be easy to, to work it out, and you will not work it out unless you dive in quite deeply into the, the data of what everyone needs. Yeah, so, so for sure, it's a lot of listening to do, for the future, yeah. and we know that one model will not fit all. Exactly. So yeah. we're moving into a more complicated but better world of work. More challenging, I say. Yeah. But this this is this is so 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 important. It, and again, this is why I think there's going to be winners and losers from this. It is more complicated. It is more challenging, and it needs more thought <laughs> to to make it to make it work. But a lot to do with making it work is going to be changing your, the way you work and your technologies as well. If you listen to some of the companies who are large and are fully distributed, they say what you, what you need to do is actually you need to communicate more when you're not all in the same building. You need to write more and you need to keep more documentation. So instead of, instead of, people being used to just walking over to, to someone's desk, tapping them on the shoulder, destroying their flow <laughs> uh, and asking them a question, the information should, should be available. So that's what I, partly what I mean about becoming more and more a, a digital company, that everything you need is available to you digitally. And then you just really concentrate on when, when does being together really add value? And this is what I think is going to be the key from real estate companies' point of view, that instead of trying to let someone the most amount of space for the longest period of time, I think the aim should actually be to let them the least amount of space for the shortest amount of time <laughs> because, because you can charge them a lot more for that. So I want, instead of, instead of leasing someone 1,000 square meters, I want to lease them 400 square meters, but I'm going to charge them what would have cost 800 square meters. So they are still saving money, but they're actually paying me tw almost twice as much for, for the space because, because that space, and I will have to have spent more money on that space, that space is going to be perfect for them. So when that space is going to be brilliantly aligned with what it is they they need they need to do so this this mantra of less but better i i think is okay but but all of this is going to is going to is going to be hard and and most most come not most i don't we don't know how many companies will make the effort to do it but i am convinced that the companies that do make the effort to to, to do it will be extremely productive because they'll be incredibly they'll be incredibly efficient they'll be able to hire the best talent as and, as and when they need it they will be able to afford the best real estate when they need it so in some ways you could look at it that from a real estate company's point of view they're they're our worst customer but i actually think they're going to be our best customer but we have to fit in we have to fit in with what what their need, what their needs are, but again, I mean, my 
my well-known comment about no company wants an office, what they want is a productive workforce. Anyone, if, if we in real estate can help a company have a more productive workspace, workforce, that is worth much more than whatever increase we might get on rent or cutting, cutting utilities bills and stuff. I think that's a good quote to title the... Yeah, the, the whole the, uh, podcast, the whole episode. <laughs> the whole episode, yes. And I think it's such an interesting... It's such, it's such an interesting time. And you sort of, I, I sort of think we know, where, we know where we're going, but we don't really know what route it'll be, be, be to get there. But if, we, if somehow we can combine, you only, have, you only have to talk to people about how their last year has been. And a lot of people have found being, being at home has worked for them really well. It's, maybe it's a certain type, you know, maybe if you've got children, it's much easier because you take children to school, pick them up and all this sort of thing. Or if you have a long commute, you, you save that. So it's not ev everybody, but for a lot of people, it's worked really well. And we just need to, we need to find a way to, you know, make the office better, make home better, just make everything better. You know, I, I always think there's, there's so much opportunity to make everything better. Yeah. And but, uh, to understand. When we've run out of things to make better, then we're, we can stop, but you never will. So. <laughs> It drives the point of empathy and listening and listening and listening and understanding what really people need, uh, as you said, and how, what's their best self? Where is it manifesting? Where, because we are so different, we are introvert, extrovert, we have different needs. Even when we are doing the same job, let's say we are two accountants, maybe we need different setups to be performant. I, I, I forgot to make that point. The point about introvert and extrovert is really important. Office, offices are almost designed for people like me. Yeah. You know, put me in a room, yap, 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 yap. <laughs> but it's easy for me. That's just what I do. I'm not trying to do it. Um, but for other people, in, in fact, actually, one of the, there's a, there's a podcast with a chap called Matt Mullenweg, who's the boss of Automatic, who are the company behind WordPress. And WordPress... 40, what is it, 40% of all websites yeah. are based on, on WordPress. Now, they have over 1,200 employees in 60-something companies, and they've always been fully, fully remote. And there's an interview with him with Sam Harris on the Sam Harris podcast, which is really good. And he talks about decision-making in a distributed company. And he's asked, well, how, how the hell do you make any decisions? You know, if I would need to make a decision, we get everyone in the office in, around a meeting in an hour, we've made a decision. And he said, yes, that's true. You can do that in an office, but you can't do it at home. But he says, we make decisions slower, but I think we make better decisions. Because he says, in that office meeting, you'll have the loudest people and the most senior people will be heard more. And most of the comments will be immediate reactions. If you take a bit more time, you pull in all of the people who don't like making instant decisions, are more comfortable going for a walk and thinking about it, or thinking about it in the shower. And they come back the next day and they make a... And he said, we find that our decisions... We, we, we have a thing you have to make a decision within, <coughs> within 24 hours. But he said, we find they're better because it gives people a bit of time and all the different types of people a bit more time to to think to think about it and 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 but but you have to design the way the company works to to enable that but it is exact exactly your point you can have two accountants one might need total peace the other might need heavy rock music in their headphones all day long and they work better like that and i think if you think of sp if you think of sports teams so think of uh, tour de france cyclists the work that is done to make each little bit one percent better 
and make sure the diet is right and make sure that the athletes had enough sleep and make sure this and make sure that. If you think of the work that goes into enabling an athlete to be the best athlete they can be and compare it with the management time that is put into enabling an employee to be the best employee, we don't do anything. <laughs> you know, we do so much work for athletes and then we get to the office, we don't really do much. And I think we've got to, once we do that, there's, there's lots of low hanging fruit. I think we could make people ha happier and more productive relative, relatively easily. We well, could jump up a bit. That totally but anyway, opens must a different perspective upon productivity and how you engage with your team and your your people and yeah, how you look at uh, humans in the company, not just as a mere resource, but really as the driver of the whole thing. And uh, yeah. I think I, I like your uh, example with the athletes and I'm going to steal it. Pretty soon <laughs> I, I think I stole it, it from someone, yeah. but, it, but it, is, it is so true. It's, but one, one, one last thing, um, I was watching the uh, Le one of the Leesman Index webinars. What they were saying was that after all the research they've done, the two, the two most important factors in people going back to the office are firstly the employee's personal circumstance, so do, which is mainly, do they have a, an appropriate space to work at home? Um, and the second thing is the quality of the, the quality of the office. So where, where they, where they did surveys, where they, they surveyed the office and they surveyed the home situation, the better quality office, the more people wanted to go back. So there really, there really is a direct correlation. If you make a really good office, people want to go, want to go back to back to it. And they they did a really good graphic. The the the, the correlation is is absolute. The better the office, the easier it is to to get people to to come back. So look at looking out for people's circumstances, and then make make your workplace better. <laughs> it's really not it, it, it boil, that's what it boils boils down to yeah thank you anthony for for sharing everything with us thanks god it's uh, on record and i can listen to you again and take notes again <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for all our listeners and for your generosity of sharing all this with us Ladies and gentlemen, this is a glimpse of uh, Anthony Slumbers and we encourage you to find out more because there's a lot of, lear of learning to go and to prepare yourself for what's coming next. And thanks again, Anthony, for being with us. Always a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Re really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. And best, best good wishes with your podcast. It's important. So Thank good you luck. so much. Thank, Thank you, you and have a happy spring. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Great to Take you. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Anthony Slumbers is always relevant and insightful. I usually get in student mode every time I'm listening to him. Like we anticipated, office buildings are not dead in the new normal, but office developers and operators have to do a much better job in understanding the needs and challenges of their clients. The winners of this game are going to be those locations that can bring a hospitality mentality to space as a service and go the extra mile to win hearts and minds. Send us your feedback and ideas about this episode. You already know where to find us. On campus.